Hi there, and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. This year, our gardens took some tough hits, but it gives us a chance to take a fresh look as we embark on renewal. Today, garden designer Ginger Hudson guides us with concepts to refresh our designs or start a garden for the first time. On tour, let's visit a gardener who gave her new space the personal touch. Diana Kirby blogs about life's fundamental connections at sharing nature's garden. And that's what her garden is all about, sharing. Homegrown vegetables for her husband Jeff Eller and their children. Plants that support wildlife. And outdoor living where family and friends of all ages can find a spot just right for them. My first memories of gardening are probably when I was in first grade and my mother had a vegetable garden in Colorado and I remember picking rhubarb straight out of the garden and eating it just like that, sour as it was, and thinking that was just the greatest thing. My dad is a gardener and has a beautiful yard, and I guess that's always influenced me. A master gardener, Diana is always experimenting to find the best plants for her clay soil and to outwit the front yard's deer. When we moved into this house, the front yard was landscaped, and there was the pool and the cabana, but the backyard was scrub brush and stumps and rocks. And so um, that was my first project, was to take on putting in a yard for our daughter and doing some landscaping back here. Although she removed most of the existing plants, she kept the palm trees around the pool. In their borders, Diana selects no fuss, no muss plants, since the windy site would send fragile flowers straight into the pool. Back here around the pool, I think, it needs a tropical sort of feel. Along with diversity and texture, Diana wants color, but she takes it easy and chooses her points of focus with intention, since these rooms are for winding down. Since Diana doesn't want to waste an inch of potential garden, she filled a raised bed behind the pool with color, fragrance, and wildlife sponsors. Beyond the patio, she wrangled scrub brush to extend the family's activity areas. I wanted to soften the space. We have, with the pool and the cabana and the kitchen out here, we have a lot of hardscape. And I really like the idea of softening that space out there. A priority was a playscape. At the time, their daughter Callie was an infant, but Diana's design anticipated the current escapades. She also earmarked room for a greenhouse, a recent addition that fills up in winter. Between the two, she made her cutting garden. Another priority was organic vegetables. I knew that the first thing I wanted to put in was a vegetable garden because uh, I think there's nothing better than fresh homegrown tomatoes and squash and all the wonderful vegetables we can grow here. For beauty with function, she built a winding path. Its granite seams are natural habitats for Texas tough visions of England. I trek back to the vegetable garden and the greenhouse a lot, and I would wear a path that way anyway. But um, I like the idea of softening it and creating um, something that's pretty and textured and colorful out into the grass. Um, just makes it a little more interesting. In the side yard, she beautifully handled another function. When we get those occasional heavy rains here in Central Texas, the water comes from my neighbor's yard and comes down the driveway and comes down the front walkway and goes right in front of the front door of the house and right in front of the garage. So after you know a year or so of stepping in puddles to get into my own house, I decided we needed to do something about it. So um, we had some French drains put in and um, we did the, the river rock bed walkway along the side of the house to, uh, to help with that. 
As Diana tackles one area after another, her son Dustin often jumps in to lend a hand or a new idea. In front, Diana's options for color and standout foliage face a caveat. The challenge in gardening with deer is that there are some deer resistant plants, but there are no deer proof plants. In years like we've had these last few summers where we have such a terrible drought and such terrible heat, they're starving and they will eat just about anything. Finding the compromise is important to her because this garden is about sharing. And along with plants that attract other wildlife, Diana wants a front yard that invites people to enjoy it. I want them to, to see layers and levels of plantings and things that are interesting, you know, different textures that play off of each other and, and color combinations that work really well together. Her blog, Sharing Nature's Garden, started over Jeff's suggestion at the breakfast table. About two weeks after he made the suggestion, I decided to try and I sat with my laptop late into the night trying to figure out blogger and all the rules and um, set it up myself and have been loving it ever since. It's given me an opportunity to meet another entire world of gardeners who share my passion for um, gardening and you know it's a great opportunity to share ideas and to learn from each other. But it's also a chance for other gardeners to learn from her including her wisdom that a garden is not all about work but taking some time to have fun in it. We spend a lot of time here. Um, I spend a lot of time pruning and picking and digging, um, but I try to remember to just enjoy it too. Sometimes that's hard for gardeners. I found a lot of my friends as well. It's hard to be outdoors in your space and just sit. So I've made a concerted effort to do that, but we do, we come out here and we, we swim and my husband cooks in the kitchen and we have family over and you know, just a few hours at a time. It doesn't even have to be an occasion. We just like to come out here and, and enjoy being outdoors. All right, and thanks for sharing your garden with us. We're now gonna turn our attention to garden design, and I'm very excited about this. I always love to talk about design. My guest is Ginger Hudson, who writes about a design and gardening on the web, and she has her own website. Also teaches at the Wildflower Center at the Laguna Gloria School of Art. Welcome uh, to our program. It's great to have you with us. Thanks, Tom. I'm very glad to be here. Well, we're gonna be talking about uh, helping people with some big, simple ideas mm -hmm. that will give them uh, the, kind of the tools they need to get out there and reshape their landscape. And after the weather we've experienced for the past year, <laughs> some of the landscapes out there need reshaping. <laughs> exactly. The last couple of years have been torture on our gardens, but they give us an opportunity to get out there and see what we really want, to open up the space. And mm -hmm. you can get out in the garden and look at that space and see where you want to be and how you want to rearrange it. Yeah, the, well, the opening of the space means dead plants. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of dead plants all over. You know, all those people who bought into all those uh, tropical palms mm -hmm. are probably feeling the pain right now. But mm -hmm. we have, um, again, uh, a lot of opportunity when you have these points of transition in the garden. And rather than being, oh, poor pitiful us about it, this is an opportunity really sometimes to start afresh. And one of the things that uh, so many gardeners lack is uh, uh, our key ideas about uh, how to pull together the plants they love and the, mm -hmm. the spaces that they're going to be inhabiting. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's start off by talking about some of the key concepts they really need. Mm -hmm. I always wonder about how you get started. Well, through my experience in teaching over the years, I've learned to distill the topics down to just a few issues. And the first is your focal point. Okay. What is it that takes you out into the garden? Why do you want to be in the garden? Or did somebody give you a gift for Christmas, a fountain or a piece of art? Well, there's your focal point. That's your first starting point for getting mm -hmm. out into the garden. Where do you want to place that? Mm -hmm. Or do you sit in a certain room and look out one window all the time? What exactly. are you looking at? That's, to me, it's all about connecting. Mm -hmm. You know, you connect the inside to the outside. How you, how you transition into the garden is also real important. But focal points are key, you know, because too many of us, I think, uh, 
collect a big assemblage of plants and other mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. but then then we feel something's lacking because it's too random. We, it, it doesn't have any uh, sense of kind of unity. And, exactly. And focal points can do that. It, right. You get uh, plant lovers will have just a collection of plants, mm -hmm. but if you pick out that one that you want to be the special one, a specimen plant is what we would call that kind of focal point. A, pretty red bud or flower and plum, Mexican plum, and that's your object. That's where you start with that one feature that you really like to look at and then shape around there. Mm -hmm. And how do you get to that point? That's your next idea of your right. axis or your flow or your path. How right. do you get to those objects? Well, let's, okay, so focal point is number one. Mm -hmm. Use that as a kind of a place to focus the energy of the plant. Maybe build up some things around uh, your mm -hmm. focal point so that mm -hmm. you get that sense that this is the important thing. Yes. But then this whole idea of what uh, designers use the word axis. Mm -hmm. I like to say view corridors. <laughs> Good, good uh, interpretation. Mm -hmm. And axes are more uh, of a formal reference. Mm -hmm. uh, old gardens were very geometrically laid out, and right. they don't have to be that way here because here mm -hmm. we like to do wildscapes. Sure. So your corridor can be curved or it can be straight. Right. But the view corridor is what leads your eye to that beautiful thing or sitting point or. Mm -hmm focal point in your garden. Right. And if you have a small garden, make that corridor a little curved and it gives you the illusion of having a bigger garden. Right, right. And and, and view corridors also, I mean, they tell you what's important. Mm -hmm. They tell you where to walk. Mm -hmm. They tell you where to look. Mm -hmm. And and they actually can direct your steps because view corridors often become pathways, right? Right, exactly. And when you're defining those pathways, what you'll do with the gardens to the edge of the pathways or fill them with masses of the things that you like. You have your focal point, but along the way, put groups of objects, uh, plants that are similar mm -hmm. to help define that path if you're not going to use a hardscape material or something else to define the path. Yeah. So we have, uh, we have focal points, uh, view corridors or axes, and then also a very important thing when considering the design is scale and how mm -hmm. big things are, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is where you might have to do a little more research, especially in your plants. Uh, scale is a relationship of size to, of objects to one mm -hmm. another. And so what I try to discourage or encourage people to do is make sure the plants or plant groupings or tree that you're selecting works well with the size of your house or the size of your garden. Yeah. For instance, you wouldn't want a 60 foot tall bald cypress if you lived in a small bungalow that was really tiny and then you have this vast space between the two undefined. Right, right. And no, scale to me also means this, the size of our planting beds. You know, mm -hmm. so many of the new homes you see out there, um, they, they're that often are impressive, even if they're built to look like bungalows, they're architecturally busy and impressive spaces, and yet the planting beds are these thin little strips, or they, <laughs> they plunk a tree down, right. and that's it. You know, so you need some massing and, mm -hmm. and large scale beds, I think, to kind of mm -hmm. soften all of that. And right, and to bring those plants away from the house. A lot of times, like you say, the developer puts them right up next to the house. Mm -hmm. It's bad for the house, but it also doesn't give your garden a sense of size. Move the garden away, get rid of some of that turf grass mm -hmm. they put in to save money, get the plants in that are more interesting, beneficial for wildlife, and fun to look at. Let's talk about how some people can get these ideas down on paper. Okay, We're, we've got a lot of folks out there in the audience who are probably interested. Mm -hmm. um, they have some tools available to them too, usually. Most, most homeowners have a property site uh, drawings that show where the house is in relationship to the lot and, and have the outlines of the lot, right? Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. where you start with most landscape designs? Yes, that if you have your site plan from when you closed on your house or your property, you have the basic tool that you need. That way you don't have to go measure everything yourself. Mm -hmm important. <laughs> yes, it saves a lot of time and right, headache. Right. So what I do with my students in my classes is we enlarge that site plan to a quarter inch or half inch scale that's easy for you to read and draw on and visualize yourself. Mm -hmm. And the importance is to make sure you're working in a scale that you understand. And this time scale <clears throat> meaning a ruler, an architect's ruler. Right. So you enlarge your scale uh, start with your flow mm -hmm. or your object like we've talked about before, the important elements. Just get those in pencil on your new site plan 
and then start looking for the plants that you like. Yeah, it's really that simple organizing things around these points of connection. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, make, you know, for example, putting that focal point where you can see it <laughs> right. from your home. <laughs> or get to it. And then creating, an, uh, creating a pathway to get to it. Right. Simple little connected things mm -hmm. that will make the garden a much more pleasurable experience and uh, bring that sense of unity that uh, design is supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. And again, it doesn't all have to be formal European geometry. Mm -mm. Uh, that here in Central Texas, um, that we like that the kind of the loose shagginess of our native mm -hmm. plants and the grasses and all those kinds of things as well. So, feel free to explore and experiment. And there are a lot of uh, good natives out there that it will not only beautify the garden, but also kind of bring in some of the visitors that we love too, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And look around at what's looking good right now. What made it through the freeze? Look what was blooming last summer. All kinds of things were still blooming last summer. Yellow bells, desert willows. Right now in the winter, we have rosemary, flowering quince. Mm -hmm. There are things that do survive our weather. And now you have the opportunity to get those in. And now is the best time to, to be planting in the winter. Well, for so many of these things, especially the woody shrubs and the mm -hmm. trees and things like that, it, you really do want to start getting stuff in the ground. Mm -hmm. Who knows what next summer will bring, right? right. Exactly. <laughs> right. So uh, I want to talk real briefly about how people can learn more from you. Uh, and uh, you do teach uh, classes, as I referenced. Real briefly, tell us about those. The classes at Laguna Gloria mm -hmm. are through the art school. Okay. They're a four-week program, one night a week. Okay. And students learn all the tools they need, the art supplies. Mm -hmm. It's hands-on. Mm -hmm. They get it done in the class, their new design. Cool. And their design will be unique. Yeah. They did it themselves. Great. And you would be surprised at all the people who come through the classes and think, I can't draw. Well, it doesn't matter. You yeah. can learn. It's Great. not that hard. And you also teach at the Wildflower Center. The Wildflower Center is the Go Native U program mm -hmm. run through UT Informal Classes. Fantastic program. Great. Six weekends, different subjects every weekend. All right. Well, that's great. And uh, very accessible places to go learn. Mm -hmm. Great tips for the home mm -hmm. folks out there. So, mm -hmm. again, uh, focal points, axis, and scale. I think that's pretty easy. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you, Tom. All right, it's been a real pleasure. And coming up next is our friend Daphne Richards. Hi, and welcome to Down to Earth. Today's question is about whether or not it's safe to use water from a water softener on houseplants. This water is salty, so you're right to be concerned about it. It can damage your plants, as all salty water can. But in order to deal with that, the water is safe to use. You need to leach it from the soil regularly. And by that, I don't mean to water the plant more often, but when you do water your plant, you need to use more water. So that means taking the plant to the sink, if it's small enough, or perhaps to the bathtub. So if you're watering those plants from the top and you're watering them with the watering tray under the bottom, you do need to be more in the habit of taking them and making that water leach all the way through the soil. Also, I've been asked about succulents, whether it's safe for succulents as far as using the more water. And again, you wanna take those plants to some place and leach the water, but not water them more or more often. Our plant this week is the red bird of paradise. The Cesalpinia pulcherima. It's very important that you get the right species there because there are species of Cesalpinia that are native to California that are not as cold tolerant in our environment. This plant may be evergreen if we have a mild winter, but of course this winter it would have frozen to the ground, which is also fine because it's root hardy into the teens, but if it's lower than that, you can mulch it heavily and still get it through the winter. You want to prune these plants to the ground even if they remain evergreen because that creates a more lush foliage and the plant will be less leggy, which makes it more attractive. It needs very little water. It's tolerant of neglect. So the less you water it, the more you ignore it, the better the plant is going to do. It's really happiest in full sun. It won't be happy with any amount of shade. It also likes well-drained soil and it can get very large, as tall as six feet in good conditions. And it's usually also about five to six feet wide. It doesn't require any fertilizer, as I said, and it requires very little care. So ignore it as best you can, prune it down to the ground in the winter, and it will be a very great plant for you. It's time in your garden this week to divide and transplant any overgrown perennials. 
you planted some perennials last spring, then they probably don't need dividing yet. You'll just need to trim those back. But plants like Gaylardia and Yarrow, if you planted them early, it's not time, as I said, to divide them. But if they've been in the ground two or three years or more, and they're getting a little overgrown, you need to go ahead and dig those up and then divide the root ball. And you can do that by digging the entire plant out of the ground, and then you can either use your foot and the shovel, if you do that kind of gently, and cut the root ball, or you can actually use a knife to get those out of the ground. Once you do that, you can plant the divided portion, divide it in either to two or to three pieces or more, depending on how large it is. And then you can put one of those pieces back into the ground where it came from, and then move the rest around the rest of your garden, or give them away to your friends and family. Lots of gardeners like to have pretty plants such as these. And yarrow and gaylardia do need to be divided pretty regularly. We'd love to hear from you, so send us your question or plant of the week from your garden to klru.org slash ctg. Thanks, Stephanie. Now let's check in with John Dromgul for Backyard Basics. Hello, gardening friends. Welcome to Backyard Basics. It's getting real close to springtime, and America's um, number one vegetable grown by everybody, tomatoes. Of course, you knew that, didn't you? So um, we're getting ready. We need to get prepared, and we need to get that soil in really good shape. One of the things that um, I do is make compost at home. I use a three-bin method. It really allows me to be putting in uh, vegetables every day, having some that are beginning to finish, and then the raw materials over here waiting to go in, and then an empty one. So I can keep turning the piles, which are very important, in order to get a beautiful compost like this one right here. You can see the little sticks in there. It doesn't make any difference if those are still there. Here's a leaf. But when they crumble up like this, that's a good sign that the compost is ready. Look how beautiful a compost you can make at home, too. I just use leaves and vegetable scraps every day. On occasion, I put a little bit of soil in there, but um, it's beautiful. It takes a while. You can do this at home. This is the best compost you're going to find anywhere. It's the compost that you make at home. So. What we're going to do is in that spot, a good sunny spot out in the yard too, it's very important, and they really like a nice soil. And that's what the compost is all about, building a healthy soil full of microorganisms. Those are the guys that broke down the raw materials, and so now they go into the garden. Isn't that nice? And so we don't use a lot of nutrients at first. We try to just get that slow start, get it established. The one thing that we need to work in would be minerals. Mineralizing the soil is really important. The trace minerals are essential because nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, well, that's not enough. We need to balance that soil, and that's what minerals do. You'll find them in the nurseries. They're not hard to find, but uh, that really helps um, get the plant off to a good, good start and all the way through. So a little bit of compost and some minerals in a nice sunny spot in the yard, you've got a good spot to grow some tomatoes. I like to start our own here. It's because I can grow things that you can't find in the nursery trade. And so, um, so here's two different varieties right here. We mark them clearly so that we don't mix these up uh, with these. Got a lot of them here, probably won't use them all. Give some to some friends and let them try out some of these varieties also. These are heirloom tomatoes. So to get them started, you can find these little containers at nurseries or you can use an egg carton or a little Dixie cup, you know, anything like that to get going. Make sure it's got drainage. And then a nice medium to get these seedlings up. Now this little medium right here contains earthworm castings, very essential. We found that earthworm castings make all the difference in the world. And so um, we would add some earthworm castings to this blend, a little bit of sand, some vermiculite, and some of that nice compost. You're on your way to starting seeds. So we put them in these trays, we start the seeds. You gotta get early, because starting the seeds late, the tomatoes are gonna be going in late. So get started early. But early means a little bit of protection protection out there. So I like to cover my cages with a little bit of plastic and uh, that insulates them a bit and it keeps the cold winds off of them and it really keeps the insects away too in the very beginning. Boy, that's the best thing to do is get them off to a good start that's insect free. Now if you go into the nurseries, you're going to see a lot of seed packets like this that maybe you're not familiar with but worth experimenting with in your home garden. So these are all heirloom varieties in this particular collection. 
I like the green zebra. That's a very nice one, but there's other great ones to be using out there. So, as you can see, it's time to get out there and start working on your tomatoes. Get that bed together. You know, it really makes a difference. And when you see the results, you're going to see a bunch of tomatoes just like this one for your, from your home garden. From Backyards Basics, I'm John Dromgoo, and I'll see you next time. Check out klru.org slash ctg for more tips, online video, and the blog. Next week, we'll look at cleaning up agaves and aloes. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg.